Welcome to this episode of We the People, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks for joining us. One of the most exceptional aspects of America is the incredibly generous nature of its citizens. And according to the World Giving Index, the United States has consistently been the most charitable country in the world. More than 2% of our GDP is dedicated to charity, a figure that is twice the European Union's average. And it's around this time of year with the holidays fast approaching that Americans start thinking more about their charitable giving. And with that in mind, our guest today is a philanthropic leader who's addressing the challenges and championing the opportunities within the sector. Elise Westhoff is the president and CEO of the Philanthropy Roundtable. I'm very honored to serve on the Roundtable board. This is an organization that has for years been an effective advocate for a free and vibrant society through philanthropic freedom. Prior to joining the Roundtable, Elise was executive director of the Snyder Foundation, where she also served as a grant program director. Earlier in her career, Elise directed major fundraising gifts for neuroscience programs at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Elise, welcome. It's great to have you. It's great to be here and great to see you, Rick. Absolutely. Elise, as I mentioned earlier, America has always been known for its generosity. Uh, But at the outset of the pandemic, I think there was a lot of concern, very justifiable concern, that charitable giving would go down and that nonprofits would suffer as a result. But that wasn't the case. What happened? Well, Rick, you know, America really is the most generous country in the world, as you said. And um, we really faced unprecedented challenges in, in 2020, as we all know. And people stepped up in unprecedented ways. We had nearly half a trillion dollars in giving in 2020, which was a 5% increase in in total giving over the year before. And it was a record-breaking year in giving. So more money than ever went to charitable giving. Uh, People were also very creative, entrepreneurial, and innovative in how they gave. They used different vehicles like donor advised funds, And they uh, invested in community foundations, which really gave them an opportunity to be quick and flexible and nimble in getting money to communities uh, in need, as many were in 2020. Um, And, you know, donor advice fund donors stepped up in a huge way in 2020. Uh, Grants to charities from donor advised funds rose to almost $35 billion in 2020, which was a nearly 30% increase over 2019. So 2020 was just really a testament to the generous nature of our country. And as you said, we were all concerned that giving would go down given the economic uncertainty, but people stepped up. They saw that it was a rainy day. If they had been saving for a rainy day, they saw that it was pouring and they gave more than ever. So it was a really inspiring thing to see. Well, that's America. I mean, there's no question that this has been a a difficult period of time for our country, but the charitable giving statistics are without question a bright spot over these past 18 months or so. Uh, Yet there are some, uh, on on some not so bright spots uh, perspectives, there's some legislative efforts right now that would seem to undermine charitable giving, most particularly the ACE Act, Uh, as it's called. Give us a general overview of how this legislation might impact philanthropy. Well, you know, charity has always been voluntary. And as you, as we just discussed, people will voluntarily give in extraordinarily, extraordinary ways when given the opportunity. Unfortunately, the ACE Act is really just a solution in search of a problem that isn't there. And what we're most concerned about here is that it's going to hurt the people in need on the ground in the communities and really stifle that generous American spirit that we all want to cultivate and grow. So the ideas behind this proposal came from liberal law professor Ray Madoff, who has been a longtime critic of donor advised funds um, and intergenerational wealth as well, and then billionaire John Arnold. And what's happening in this bill is they're really imposing their views on the best way for everyone to give Um, what their view of that is in the form of government mandates and top-down solutions. So DAFs are are really, donor advised funds are really important giving vehicle that would be harmed by this just basically unnecessary uh, and arbitrary restrictions. 
th these, this bill would place a 15 year timeline on payouts from donor advised funds. And we know that many people want to use donor advised funds for the long term health of their community. So it, this would place an arbitrary restriction on their ability to do so. And also the administrative nightmare that goes along with that of tracking every dollar in and dollar out. Um, it would also discourage philanthropists from, from using this flexible tool and, and hurt the, their ability to do so privately. A lot of people use donor advised funds um, because they want to remain anonymous in their giving and for very good reasons. Uh, some of those reasons are uh, personal safety, religious reasons, humility, just not wanting to be hit up by unsolicited uh, requests from them. And so this would really limit people's ability to, to use those tools and, um, and give privately if they so choose. It would also discourage family members from getting involved in their own foundation. This places restrictions on how family members' salaries and expenses would count toward payout um, and at private foundations where you know, other staff members would be able to count that money toward payout. So what we're worried about there is just the long-term implications of creating sort of two-tiered system. There's a right kind of board member and a wrong kind of board member. There's a right kind of staff member and a wrong kind of staff member. And with everything that we're seeing right now in terms of, you know, the push for diversity, equity, and inclusion, we just wonder what the next step of that proposal is. So we believe that donors should have the right to give how, when, and where they choose. And the restrictions that are in this bill would really limit uh, generosity and stifle giving in a time when we really need it most. Totally agree. I mean, the generosity of this country truly is unique around the world. It truly is exceptional. Uh, and the last thing we, we need is more regulation in this area. Why, why try to regulate something that is working so incredibly well? Exactly. Uh, at least philanthropy has not been immune to the culture wars that have infiltrated just about every aspect of American society. Uh, you've spoken up about identity politics, hijacking philanthropy, and specifically the culture of the philanthropic sector. Tell us what you're worried about, what's happening, and, and what are you hearing from donors on this front? Well, you know, philanthropy definitely isn't immune from uh, the broader cultural issues that our country is facing. And in fact, philanthropy is really fueling identity politics through funding from far left activists and these big progressive foundations. They're creating this kind of division in our country and polarization that I think is, is really damaging. Um, and I think what's most concerning about this is that uh, these culture wars are really hurting struggling communities that we all want to help. Part of what's happening is, you know, the ideas that are coming out of the far left are, are just bad ideas for struggling communities. Things like defund the police that would really harm communities in need. And then in addition to the bad ideas, there's an illiberal culture around um, this mentality that stifles conversation about how to help best help people in need. And in addition to that, we're really choosing winners and losers of who is, which communities are uh, okay to serve and which communities are not. And I think that in addition to creating division, it hurts people that are struggling regardless of their skin color or gender or sexual orientation as a philanthropic sector, we should be helping everyone in need, not only focusing on certain communities because they're in they're they're fashionable, while others aren't. So I think there there are a lot of issues that are happening uh, culturally in philanthropy, and uh, they really need attention. And I think we're calling attention to those issues. Absolutely, uh, Elise. You've been in this job now about eighteen months, and uh, I think you would agree that the roundtable's mission really hasn't changed under your leadership, but there, there has been a different approach. And I guess that's natural. Anytime there's a changing in the guard, uh, without question, the round table has become more vocal in advocating for philanthropic freedom and, and it's had more of a media presence. Why do you think it's so important for the round table to raise its profile at this time? Well, as we talked about earlier, you know, there's more money than ever flowing into charitable causes. 
but uh, we're concerned that that they aren't always going to the to the best ideas. And um, we believe that our values improve lives. We believe in strengthening communities, creating pathways to opportunity for every American. And, you know, really focusing on America's founding principles, the, the things that this country, the, the ideals that this country was built on that make this country exceptional. And we need to make sure that our charitable sector is promoting and advancing those ideals. So speaking up about them is really important. And underpinning all of this is uh, the, the right for donors to give how, when, and where they choose, philanthropic freedom. So um, we're, we're kind of out, you know, one of the only voices out there advocating for, for these values through charitable giving and also protecting donors' right to give how, when, and where they choose. So I think it's really important that we continue to take a strong position here at a time when people are afraid to stick their head up and take a stand. Let's drill down on that a little bit more, and let's talk some about uh, some of the Roundtable's new initiatives. Uh, What's your true diversity campaign, and what are the plans for it over the next year? Well, diversity should be based on valuing each individual looking at their character, their merit, their accomplishments, their skill sets, and their experiences. Um, It's not just a a box checking exercise. And unfortunately, that's a lot of what we see today um, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we really want to cast a positive vision of what diversity could be if we approached it in the right way. So true diversity means looking at the mission of an organization and thinking about what types of diversity would further uh, the mission and foster excellence and which wouldn't. Um, Introducing, you know, just sort of an alternative view of how organizations and foundations and even some in the corporate sector can, can bring in diversity without creating division and thinking about it in a much more rich and nuanced way than just a skin deep. So we want to really expand this effort in the next year, bring in more allies to talk about how we can keep the good parts of diversity, but, uh, you know, not focus on the parts that are just really superficial and don't define who a person is. So our principles of true diversity are to value each individual, get to know them and understand who they are, appreciate the mission that you're trying to accomplish and keep that at the center, seek diverse perspectives embrace conversation, and really foster that self-reliance and community that we all want to see. Oh, that's great. Uh, I know the Roundtable has made some changes to how it approaches its programs and provides philanthropic services. What kind of resources does the Roundtable offer, and how is it positioned to support donors? Well, Rick, as you know, when I came to the Roundtable, I, I had a vision that the Roundtable could really serve as the outsource program officers for the movement, for people who share our values of liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. So we've built a team that has a lot of rich grant-making experiences and um, understands what it's like to sit in the chair of someone trying to write a check to an effective organization. So we focus on understanding what their donor intent is um, what their passions are and how to connect them with great organizations that are doing great work on the ground um, to help them be more effective. Our team understands donor intent. Uh, We can assess individual organizations and also look at the ecosystem of organizations in the movement so philanthropists can really leverage their impact. Um, The only requirement as, as we work with donors is that they share our values and really want to move the needle on the issues that we all care about and keeping our country strong and free. Last question. Holidays are approaching. It's a major time for charitable giving. What's some advice that you can offer to donors who want to support organizations that reflect their values? Well, we all love the season of giving and uh, we know people want to support organizations that are on the ground and effective. I think the first step is really thinking about what your passion is and what you want to accomplish and um, making sure that you connect and engage with the organizations that you're considering supporting and ensure that they share that vision, they share your values, they share your passions and um, that you guys are aligned on that. Uh, Giving should be a mutually beneficial arrangement and a partnership between the organization and the the person uh, making the gift. So if you think about what your passion is, what your values are, 
and finding those organizations on the ground that are doing the work that helps you advance them. Finding that great partnership there is, I think, the key. Elise Westoff, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for your leadership, for your team's leadership. It's so important at this point in time. And as always, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of We the People. Thank you.